Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. I have to tell you about my first experience of coming to Collingwood, which was not a happy one at all. <coughs> when I was about five or six, I had very bad teeth. Here. Okay, what's wrong? Can you hear now? That's good. Okay, I'll try and <laughs> keep you listening. Anyway, when I was five or six, um, I had very bad teeth, and it wasn't my mother's fault because she uh, tried to make me drink milk and eat all sorts of good, nutritious food, but I wouldn't. And uh, I ended up with toothaches. So that meant a trip to the dentist. And from Cremor, it was an hour's trip in our uh, 1930s chef coupe. Um, the dentist was Dr. Irwin, who I think was a first cousin of my grandfather. Well, I tell you, they put me in that dentist chair and I started screaming. Um, I know now that if I'd clamped my mouth shut, he wouldn't have been able to get in there. But I think he pulled two teeth and I just kept screaming until I got out of there. But I have to tell you, um, I've had many other pleasant experiences in Collingwood. And I have to see some people I um, recognize from Collingwood Skating Club. And um, that was a lot of great fun for a lot of years. Well, I'll turn to this now. Um, this area has so much wonderful history. I think, well, I'm not going to offer to do this, but I think I could speak here every month for a year <laughs> all about this local area. And it's, it's just full of wonderful stories. I was a little bit startled when I saw the advertising brochure that said I was going to talk about Stainer, Collingwood, Craigley, Wasaga Beach. Well, I'm not. And I hope you don't, I hope you're not here under false advertising. But I I'm, I'm hope I'm going to make it up to you by talking about lots of other little places around through this country. I plan to take you on a journey, and, and um, the map's over there, and I have a pointer. And I turn this on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can move over there now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I I want to take you on a trip. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. 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 From Collingwood down uh, to Ottawa, Dundrun, Glen Huron, Dunedin, Lavender. Um, no, I'm skipping Cedar, Cremor, and Vanda. And one of my big aims tonight is to make sure everyone knows where Bath is. But I'm not going to do them in that order. When I first um, started preparing for this presentation, I wrote 24 pages. And I realized that was far too much for you to sit and listen to. So I've had to leave out a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Um, the description of Ontario before settlement of the Europeans is a very interesting one. And I want to recommend this book, The Once and Future Great Lakes Country. It tells of a time when there were pine trees with trunks that were five feet across. And um, uh, another interesting thing was the amount of land cleared in southern Ontario. I was a bit, I was surprised about that. I hadn't thought of that. But the native people that lived in southern Ontario cleared quite a lot of land. And I know you had Pat Rabel here a while ago, and uh, she's sitting down there in the middle. And um, um, the <coughs> Indians that lived around here were great land clearers. So that's something I didn't know about Ontario before. I read this book. Well, in, in the 1800s, there were Europeans that were too well off, that um, thought they'd have a better life in Canada. And the government meant to please them, so they hired surveyors 
and into the giant trees with the bears and wolves came a man called Thomas Kelly and his band of ten surveyors. And they were here to survey Nottawasaga Township. Quite a few years ago, I was in the uh, Ontario archives and I was able to hold in my hand the small notebook that Thomas Kelly had maybe carried around in his pocket. And um, I know, I, I read his notes word for word about Nottawasaga Township. Well, since that time, the, the notebook has been microfilmed and it's um, safe from handling by human hands. And it's very interesting. Um, Kelly's um, notes indicate that he was doing very well. It was late in the fall of 1832. And as I read along, I came to a tragedy. And I'm going to read to you in um, Thomas Kelly's words. On Tuesday, November 6, he wrote, about one o'clock in the morning, Roderick McDermott, a native of the county of Sligo in Ireland, and nephew of Mr. John McDermott of York, died. He complained of illness for about 10 days. It was about the 30th of October that one of the men made me acquainted with his sickness, which was occasioned by a kind of dysentery. I noticed him to have reduced much in his strength. I ordered that he should stay in one tent, in one of our tents, inasmuch as the circumstances of our business would admit until he would be fully recovered. It was about eight o'clock in the evening previous to his death before we got back from surveying. He said he felt unpleasant at being alone and thought he might be able to go out on the ensuing morning and requested some fried meat might be prepared for supper. Um, as it was customary for us to boil our pork on almost all occasions. He ate his supper considerably better than he usually did. For some time, uh, he noticed him to be delicate in his appetite, and we went to bed. He was heard about 12 o'clock to speak to Pat Howard, who being tired after the day made no reply. I awoke in about an hour after and heard him give two or three heavy sighs. I called him by his name but got no answer. I called still louder and got none. I then awoke James McCowan who lay near and turning him on his back found him in the very act of, of expiring. He was a well conducted and modest man in every respect that I could know an excellent character. We had a heavy fall of snow the hour he died until night. We had much difficulty in making boards and digging his grave. We buried him on the 19th lot in the fourth concession. I often think when I'm driving up Fair, Fairgrounds Road that somewhere over there is this dead surveyor. It's in the uh, vicinity of the East Nautilusaga Presbyterian Church on the east side of the road. And if you're driving down that road, you can think of this poor man too. Well, it's written beyond doubt that the first settlement in Nottawasaga was at Dunedin. Israel Bowerman of Prince Edward um, County came to what is now Dunedin in the fall of 1832 to spy out prospects. Um, he, um, he returned the following March and moved his family with horse and oxen and, and wagon to Orangeville and then by sleigh to Dunedin. And there he found a few feet of snow which he had to dig out before he could build his log shanty. Yesterday I was at an event in Cremore. It was a, a launch of the book The Lost Diaries of Susanna Moody and um, it was her experiences in her log shanty uh, in, um, in the area of the Kawartha Lakes of Peterborough Way. And there's much talk about her hardships. And it occurred to me that this was going on in Dunedin, the same hardships, the same hardships in Dundroon and all the places around Nottawasaka. So 
I recommend that you try and find this book and think about what it was like in, in this country in those days. Israel Bowerman had a, a partner called by the name of Tupper, and they were hired by John McDonald of Gananoque to um, help settlers come in, to build mills for their convenience, and to get the country going. Now, McDonald had been given a, a great uh, grant of land, and I tried and tried, but I could never figure out why. Maybe I think he was rich, and so, <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. Um, anyway, we don't know what happened. Did Tupper and Bowerman have a disagreement? Did he get tired of what was going on? Anyway, he just disappeared. So Bowerman kept on doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, he brought in settlers, he got meals going. Um, they built a school, they built a church, as most things happen in these little communities. And as well, um, in these little communities that I'm going to be talking about, there was always an orange hall. The orange men were um, a brotherhood uh, that were together to uphold king and country and the Protestant religion. Um, and that's very true, I guess. But I also think there was a social necessity. These, these fellows were out um, working away in the bush and trying to clear land and all by themselves except their family, and they needed social help. So once a month to go off to the meeting of the Orangemen was just a real pleasure. Very often these orange halls were built before schools or churches. It was considered so important. Now here's a story from um, Dunedin. It's called The Rock Ghost. And I'd like to recommend <laughs> if you can find this someplace. It's a history of an Ottawa saga that was put out in 1934, and uh, it's got a wonderful lot of, of information in it, and this story is from that book. Peter Simon Rock was the first man to settle on Lot 9 north of Dunedin. His wife disappeared, and he um, circulated the report that she had ran away with another man. <laughs> he hired one of the, uh, in the book it says Welsh, but I know for a fact it was Welsh girls, to keep house for him. She remained but a short time and then ran away, which he greatly resented, trying to overtake her before she reached her home on the fourth line south of Cremor. Later, he went to live at Walkerton. Some years after, he murdered a man and was condemned to death. Before hanging, he confessed to have murdered his wife and buried her in the swamp on his farm in Ottawa Saga. For many years after, superstitious neighbors believed the swamp was haunted by the victim's ghost and feared to pass there at night. John Young claimed to have the power to break the spell of ghosts. He related that the fact was discovered when he was a child in Ireland, where the castle of Lord Bursford was disturbed by a wandering ghost. Jack was carried there and allowed to go to sleep, which broke the spell and permanently ended the ghost's visit. In connection with the rock ghost, he was not thinking of his power as he was passing the swamp one evening. And feeling a bit tired, uh, he sat down on a log and went to sleep. That settled the rock ghost. <laughs> now, um, I think I'm all hooked up, so <laughs> we're going to go from Dunedin, and the road is marked on here, but we follow the Mad River down to Cremo. Cremor actually got its start um, two or three miles to the north, to the south, up the fourth line, and um, it was in an area that ended up being called Purple Hill, and the purple had something to do with the orangemen up there too. So there we are again with the orangemen. A man called William Nalty was hired by John McDonald, whom we heard about in Dunedin, um, and. Um, he, he was to come and, and sell lots and do the same kind of work. Well, um, 
uh, Nalty built a colonization office up on the hill and a small store of things that uh, settlers might need. And I've always wondered about this, and I don't know how to find the answer. Um, how do you get a bunch of axes through the bush, uh, walking <laughs> all the way from, say, Bradford up to what's now Cremont? But anyway, and apparently they had things like that for the settlers. The big complaint above of the settlers was that there were no mills. Uh, anybody who wanted to get a bit of grain ground into flour had to uh, walk and carry the bag uh, of wheat to either Hornings Mills or, or Barry. And so they definitely wanted um, um, uh, mills. So uh, Nolte went back to Gananoque, to John McDonald, and told him this. And he said that he had just the man that would look after this sort of thing. It turned out to be his brother-in-law. His name was Edward Webster. Uh, so Webster took on the job. Uh, in Brockville, he loaded um, a run of stones, a sawmill, and a carding mill, and set, set off in the boat. And they went through the Great Lakes, through the Welland Canal, which was just new, um, on around uh, to the Nordwestauga River, where he stopped someplace and somehow got all of this equipment overland to Cremor, beside the Ned River. And uh, that was the beginning of Cremor, about 1845. Although, who knows if the dates are really right now. We have no real proof of that. Uh, Edward Webster, well, I think he was in his 20s. He became very excited about, about this wonderful opportunity. And he had great dreams. And so he got in contact with his brother George and brought him to um, the area. George was a millwright and he ran the mills and he was also a carpenter and he helped build many of the first buildings in Cremor. Um, Edward got busy. He organized uh, the first school or helped organize the first school, the Anglican church. He opened a post office and a store and he was generally Mr. Bigwig. Um, now, Cremar didn't start where, where it is now. It started across the river on a flat of land. And over there, there were um, mills and um, furniture factory and blacksmiths and all sorts of stuff going on. Well, Edward became more and more interested in this place and he was able to buy some land. He brought in a surveyor and had the town site of Cremar all um, laid out with the streets and lots. And he planned to become rich, probably like uh, his mentor, John McDonald. However, it didn't quite work out that way. Edward got in over his head and um, went bankrupt. And uh, so in 1862, um, he and his wife and eight children left Cremor never to return. And he ended up dead and buried in California. And that's another long story. However, George uh, wasn't quite the enthusiast, but he, he hung on there, he persevered, and built and ran a few mills, and had a family, and then ended up having grandchildren, and so on, and uh, it turns out I'm one of his great-grandchild. <laughs> um, there's a lot to say about Cremor. I think it's probably my specialty. There are so many books. I have some of them here. There's, um, has the bell rung yet? That's all about the school. And uh, Jean, whoever, wherever you are. <laughs> you told me about Bayview. Well, it's in here. And there's a glimpse of Cremor's Pass. That's really good. And um, one called the Bridges of Cremor Mills and the other Night Train to Cremor. So I think Probably some of them are in the Collingwood Library, and uh, they're available to get. Well, I could tell you lots and lots of stories, but I, I had to pick out just a couple. Um, there was an agricultural society formed in uh, Nottawasaga Township very early, and the aim was to make better farmers out of the people that were here. Um, and our Great Northern Exhibition is a continuation of that agricultural society that was formed so many years ago. And here's a story that was told 
uh, about the fair that was held in Creedmoor in 1858. It was told by a man called Mr. Davis. Um, my friend Dorothy was here for a few minutes and it, it was her great uncle or great great uncle, Mr. Davis. Um, the fair was held on the common between Elizabeth and Caroline Streets and Mill and Collingwood Streets. One of the largest crowds Mr. Daver ever saw at Cremor attended that fair. He estimated that there were 3,000 present. They came from Duntroon, Stainer, Collingwood, New Lowell, Glencairn, Mulmer Township, Maple Valley, and Singhampton. Entries for farm products were many, and the competition between ex exhibitors was keen. The wagon makers exhibited their wagons, and the blacksmiths their handiwork. Some implements were also shown. Ten splendid teams of horses were lined up for first money. Mr. Alec MacArthur got first for his fine team. While the fair was a great success, it was also a time when whiskey flowed freely. About every 30 feet in distance, drunks could be seen with their coats off, wanting to fight using language that would not sound good at a prayer meeting. <laughs> However, Mr. Davis said there were always some accommodating enough to hold them back so nothing serious ever happened. When evening came, a dance was held in Alex Sutherland's tavern, which Mr. Davis attended. While the dancing was going on, the usual crowd was at the bar, swallowing up booze and talking about fighting. Towards midnight, Mr. Davis and his friends decided to go home, but dropped into Kelly's tavern on their way. There they counted about 30 men, so drunk they were lying on the floor. Although talking of fighting, they couldn't do it because of their condition. <laughs> now time to get away from something funny, something serious. It's about a murder in Creedmoor in 1857. Uh, the report is from the Northern Advance that was published in Barrie. It is not often we are called upon to record a shooting in Canada, but we are informed of a most painful occurrence of the kind that occurred on Monday last. The quiet village of Cremor was thrown into a great stale of state of excitement early on that day by what is feared will prove fatal for the life of an industrious young man by the name of William Hogg, a shoemaker residing in the village. It appears young Hogg had been at variance with his stepfather, John Salter, also living near, for a considerable time past, expecting a right or property on the morning of the question. After some altercation in words, the old man walked into his house and returned with a leaded pistol and deliberately placed it to the left side of the young man fired, the ball passing under the ribs uh, to the backbone where it lodged. It was instantly removed, he was instantly, instantly removed to a tavern close by where Magistrate E. Webster was sent for, who with other assistants proceeded towards the house of Salter to arrest him. Salter, seeing this, came out to meet them and quietly yielded himself as a prisoner into their hands. He is now in Barry Jail. Um, William Hogg is buried in Cremor Cemetery. The inscription on the stone says, William Hogg died July 13, 1830, 1857, aged 20 years and 11 days. Well, we'll leave that sad kind of story behind. Um, there are many amusing stories from Cremor about animals at a time when uh, the cows wandered the streets and ate from the side of the road. Um, well, here's, here's some more animal stories. Hens were also kept by most people and sometimes had the annoying habit of laying waste the gardens of the neighbors. It was reported that Alderman Mackey and Lawyer Brown were annoyed by the trespassing hens. They wanted a good Presbyterian cat like Reverend Henry's cat, who killed his neighbor's chickens. <laughs> Another hand story ended tragically as well. Here is the words of, uh, in eight, of 1893. Citizen John True keeps a few hands, and with a view of further increasing the usefulness and appearance of his flock, 
visited the poultry yards of Richmond and Company the other day and purchased a handsome thoroughbred young corporal. Without a thought of the dire consequences to follow, he carried home his young Chanticleer and safely deposited him among his other feathered pets. Such an abrupt introduction of a stranger, however, was not looked upon with favor by Madame Hans, and after sizing up this youthful would-be lord of the harem, determined to resent the intrusion with a dash and vim so characteristic of the female uh, tribe they made for him. And not satisfied were they until they left him cold and lifeless in the embrace of death, in which this estate Mr. True found in the next visit. <laughs> now, um, well, you know where Ottawa is. Anyway, we're going north to Ottawa, no, Ottawa, and um, here, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you a lot of things because I'm trying to keep it brief. Um, Ottawa was late in development um, bet um, bet until 1855 when the railway reached Collingwood. Um, Dundrum was the end of the line. Collingwood was a draw for farmers coming to market. Uh, they came from a far, as far away as Durham, Fletcherton, Dundalk, and um, so hotels were much in demand in those horse and sleigh days. Nottawa had four hotels, not to mention how many were, might be in Collingwood, and there were ten other businesses as well at, at the early days. So down the hill, down the road, Highway 124 to Glen Huron, we're going straight south. Um, that's another place I've had to leave a lot of things out. Uh, it was first developed in the 1850s, and then in 1874, uh, the great father of the Hamilton brothers came and the Hamiltons have been there ever since with their um, mill, their feed mill, their farm supply uh, business and their um, uh, building supply business now. Um, but it's here in this, whatever, what the Hamiltons call the busiest, prettiest, smallest little village in Ontario that the Mad River got its name. Now, I'm, I'm not talking much about this, but on the top of the hill north of uh, Cremor was a very early um, Irish Catholic settlement. And one of the man, men there was um, a Mrs. Dowling. Uh, they came there about um, 1833. Uh, um, and this is, the story was told by uh, the priest from Stainer who had talked to her when she was 89 on May 1st, 1903. And here's the story. In the year 1835, Mrs. Matt Dowling of the Fourth Line, who celebrated her 89th birthday on May 1st, and who was probably the oldest living inhabitant of Nottawasaga, was one day returning home on her back, and on her back was a sack of flour, which she was bringing from a distant mill. In addition to the flower, she had in her arms her eldest child, which was a little girl of about two, I think. And laden in this manner, she forded the river at the present day Glen Huron. The stream was running turbulently. She had great difficulty in winning her way across, and no doubt she, had she not um, possessed the strength of the sturdy pioneers of those rugged days, she would have ended her experience then and there. When Mrs. Dowling reached home, she was considerably excited, and in telling of her adventure, she referred repeatedly to that mad river in which she had nearly drowned. And from that day, the stream that runs down the Osprey Hills from the Osprey Hills and rushes noisily through Cremor has been known as the Mad River. So now, on we go up the hill at the Huron, straight on south through Dunedin, and up Lavender Hill, and we get to a little community called Lavender. Well, if you went there now, uh, you would probably see five houses and um, a church, a brick church that has been turned into a residence. But at one time, it um, was a very, very busy place. Uh, it was first called Maston's 
Corners after a man called Aston. I don't know how it got the name Lavender. Uh, uh, they had a lime kiln, two churches, a post office, and a cheese factory. Now this corner is on the um, uh, the town line, and it's part of here in Terrio Street, that's out here in Collingwood. Here in Terrio Street ran from, I think it's Port Credit on Lake Ontario, straight north, but when they got to Milner Township, it's full of hills and valleys and gullies, and you just can't run a big highway through Milner. So they took a, a detour uh, to Shelburne and north on 124, and then back again into Nottawasaga Township on the town line. So that was one of the main routes uh, of the early days in Ontario. And um, I didn't want to leave Lavender without telling you uh, a bear story. It happened west of Lavender in the very early days, and it's in this book about Nottawasaga. Um, uh, the interviewer said, have you any stories to tell us about bears or wolves? Yes, I shall tell you a bear story, said Mr. Um, Coyle. Pat Rosette lived east of our home on Lot 1, Concession 9. They had no light in their shanty, so they used to throw the door open to let the light in. They threw refuse out the door. One evening, a bear came along and was eating the refuse. First thing they knew, Mr. Bear shoved his head in the door. Pat climbed, to, climbed the log wall and got up on the porch for safety. His wife could not climb up the logs, so she com was compelled to face the bear. <laughs> she grabbed the big iron poker that was used at the fireplace. She struck the bear on the nose and at the same time shoved the door shut. As the bear sprang backwards, Mr. Bear's head got caught behind his ears in the door frame and, and the door. He pulled backwards and the harder he pulled, the tighter it held him. Give him a bang on the nose, shouted Pat from Makaba. <laughs> Give it to him, Mary. Give it to him again. And Pat did not come down off his perch to stop the bear for many good sound reasons. He thought it better for Mary to do the job. The bear by this time was looking pretty sick. Mary doubled the blows on the bear's head, and the bear sank to the ground, a dead bear. When Pat was sure the bear was dead, he came down off his perch and congratulated himself on how well he had instructed Mary to kill the bear. <laughs> All right. Now, we leave bear country, and we're going down to Avedon. <laughs> Have I got anything on there? Yeah. Oh, for goodness sakes, I didn't put anything on here. <laughs> anyway, anything is not too far from Cremor. Um, anything was once a very bustling little village. And it had its first mill on the Mad River in the 1850s, and it uh, had something to do with the Crothers family, and we have Merle Crothers here tonight, who's married into that family. In 1900, they had 15 places of business. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail about the business, uh, but there's a Wild West story comes out in the evening, a robbery and a shootout. Uh, now, there's different versions of the story, and one could be as correct as the other one. I'm not going to say which one. But this one comes from the June 20th, 1899 Creebor Star. And it was great fun when I hunted it up on the uh, microfilm for the first half of, of the front page of the Creebor Star was in great big headline letters. It said, four desperados create a hot time in the evening, pull their guns and shoot at anybody who would dare to face them. A Jesse James gang act with nearly all its completeness. Two of the ruffians overpowered and captured. Well, this is what the Cremor Star said. The peaceful quietness of our little sister village of evening 
two miles distant, was ruthlessly invaded by four reckless ruffians on Tuesday last, and for a time the wildest kind of excitement reigned. As near as we can learn, just before going to press, the four men passed through Cremor on Monday afternoon and purchased a number of articles from several of our merchants. They reached evening in the evening and spent the night in Davis's barn and on Tuesday hung around the Feltis house all day. About six o'clock in the evening, they showed their real character by deliberately taking possession of the house and with drawn revolvers went through from cellar to garret, ransacking every room and appropriating to themselves everything of value they could lay their hands on. John and Herb Duff arrived on the scene and attempted to stop their operations when they were set upon by the four robbers and roughly handled. About this time, a telephone message was sent to Cremor for Constable <coughs> Turner and his assistants. He had once got a team of horses, you can imagine this, uh, and hitched up a wagon and accompanied by Jay Shields, W.J. Adams, <coughs> Ab Adams, Jack McLean, Vet Bailey and T. Medill proceeded to the scene. Just as they drew up at the hotel, the gang came out on the platform, each armed with a revolver, which they charged into the midst of the crowd. At once taking the situation in, the Cremor boys showed their mettle by immediately engaging with the Ruthians. And as Doc Bailey grabbed one of them by the throat, a bullet whizzed past his face, grazing his cheek. The fight now became hot, and the burglars, seeing that they were likely to be overpowered, attempted to make off. One of them was knocked down and secured, and the other three took their uh, heels, two of them escaping, the third one being caught hiding on the banks of the river. The two were captured and securely handcuffed and brought to the Cremor Cooler, you know about Cremor Small Scale, <laughs> Al uh, for safekeeping. Um, in the morning, they um, were seen for a preliminary hearing and then were sent to, to Barry for trial. In jail, too, I guess. Now we come to this important part, Banda. Um, put up your hand if you know where Banda is. No, not to you. Okay. I'm sure a lot of you have driven down Airport Road. So here's Stainer. You keep on going down, past down, down corners, through evening, and you'll get to a four corners. It's on the town line between um, Simcoe County and Dufferin County. The last time I was through Banda, I saw, I could see two houses, I believe it was, and no sign that it was this once very bustling place. Banda had its day uh, in the days when they were cutting pine trees, and um, uh, the great operation of cutting pine trees and a mill was down at Randwick, which, if you go down the airport road, you'll pass uh, an old schoolhouse painted red, uh, and um, there is, it's called Foxy's, and there they sell french fries, I think. Uh, the records say, Sometimes eight or ten teams in a row could be seen heading to the blacksmith at Banda. When the pines were all cut down, the mills closed, and Banda's period of use was ended. In the 1860s, Banda also had a fair. It was held, as they said, right on the street in October and attracted huge crowds. There were entries just like at Creamware for farm produce and teams of horses and cattle and so on. But the main purpose of these fairs was the market. Buyers came from Toronto to buy cattle, uh, I don't think pigs, but cattle anyway, to take to Toronto to sell. And so they came to Banda Fair and then um, drove the cattle on the road down to um, Rosemont and then to Primrose and I think on and on down the roads till they finally got to Toronto and sold the cattle. Uh, now, bullfighting wasn't on the program at Banda Fair, but one old timer remembers that when the fair was over, the boys often received a few cents to look after the livestock for a while. 
and accidentally, according to the boys, uh, two bulls would be allowed to meet, and then the boys would have their fun. Well, sorry, we have to leave all those good times in Banda and head to Duntroon, which is on Highway 124, south of here. Duntroon was the big center in those early days before the railway arrived. In a sense, it was the end of the line. It was the north end of your Ontario Street, and also the main focus of the trail that came from Barrie, uh, up the Sunnydale Road and turning west to what became Steiner, and on into what's now Duntroon, and in some cases it went, um, they went straight on to Meaford over something called um, the Mail Road. Um, men on horseback or men walking carried the mail from Barrie uh, way up to Meaford and to Old Sound. Dunedin, as you have heard, has declared itself the first settlement in uh, 1832, but Duntroon was not far behind in 1834. The place was called Beaumont at first. New arrivals came from Ireland, Germany, and the island of Isla in Scotland. They arrived with no money, no supplies. Worst of all, they had no skills. The government gave them five-acre lots. <coughs> Um, in Beaumont or Duntroon. Uh, now this was written it, up in this book about Nautilus Saga, uh, what they had to do, and yesterday when I was listening about um, Susanna Moody, I was thinking of this. These pioneers had to build for themselves, cut logs, and carry them in. They had no oxen to draw them out, so they had to draw them by strength of their own selves. They split the logs in two and scooped them out and made what they call troughs for the roof. Then for a door, they split a, a log thin and put a split piece of timber across the other split pieces for battens, and they pinned them to the door. They had no nails, so hung the doors with wooden hinges. They put no floors in at first, but later they did. And for the windows, having no glass, they cut a small hole in the wall and put a thin slab of split wood and when they wanted to keep when they wanted to keep out the cold. For fireplaces they built up stones at the back for um, a piece and then made the rest of the chimney with mud and sticks. Sometimes the chimney did not draw smoke very well and it would take a shortcut at the door. When they were uh, helping each other with the work, they were as bad as they were in the Tower of Babel, for they could not understand each other. The Scotch could talk little or no English, nor the Dutch any Gaelic. However, they managed somehow to were made of the right stuff as the pioneers, and they were good neighbors. One of my favorite books is called Reminiscences of a Canadian Pioneer. And I have um, the first copy. Um, I think there were other printings made. Um, and I have been told it's available on the internet. Uh, the the um, fellow that wrote it, Samuel Thompson, made his way across the ocean in 1833 and lived for a while in Sunnydale Township. And I, I think from reading it, um, he thought there were too many mosquitoes in Sunnydale, and so he decided to move up and find a place at Duntroon. And here he built himself uh, quite a lovely house with a picket fence in, and he talks of being able to look north to the bay and maybe across to Christian Island. And uh, I think as you're uh, approaching uh, Duntroon from the north, you, you'll see a slight hill there and I think that's probably where he built his house. Uh, the part I like best of all from his book, and I think that often in our country in the winter. He said, the chief inconvenience we sustained in Ottawa Saga arose from the depth of snow in winter, which was generally four feet and sometimes more. <laughs> A few years ago, I was able to speak to one of, um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, um, two of the Germans who came where Conrad and Mary Swalm. They were either Mennonite or Dunkard, and I'm not sure which. Um, a few years ago, I had the good fortune to speak to one of his uh, descendants in Duntroon, and she told me about Conrad and Mary's hardships. 
They made their way to Barry, but for some reason were delayed. Uh, so it was in October 1834 that they walked from Barry, each carrying a child and a bundle of belongings. You can imagine their horror on arrival to find the ground covered with snow and no shelter anywhere. There was a colonization office um, where the Catholic Church is now on Highway 91, and there they received two axes, blankets, some flour, a hoe, and a few other supplies. So they hastily got a shanty built and uh, spent, the, spent the winter there. The family grew, and um, today there are many descendants, and there are still some living around the Duntroon and Stater area. There's so much to tell you about Duntroon. Another bear story is about the first school, about whiskey served up in buckets with a dipper for drinking. Uh, there's also a very touching story about Flora McDermott, a tall, lovely young woman of 20, who lost her life at the birth of their first baby because there was no medical help. But here is my last story. It came from the Collingwood Enterprise of 1907 and it's the reminiscences of F.T. Hodgson, and perhaps some of you know who he is, but I don't. He said, somewhere about the winter of 1853 or 54, at the township meeting held at the corners of Bullmore, now Duntroon, an event occurred that I can never forget. It was a beautiful winter's day and gathering was, the gathering was from all parts of the township, particularly from Cremor and the fourth and sixth lines. There had always been rivalry between the Highland Scotch element and the Irish. Good natured it was, but both sides loved a bit of a scuffle when too well primed with whiskey. On this occasion, before the polls closed, a race was proposed by some of the men between an Irish and a Scotch champion. The two competitors chosen were Sandy Kerr for the Irish and Sandy Campbell for the Scotch. Both these young fellows were well braced up with plenty of straps of good malt whiskey. The crowd gathered, the course was measured, and with a one, two, three, they were started. Neither of the racers could run in a straight line, and before the goal was reached, they had considerably covered more than the measured distance. <laughs> Eventually, they finished so close together that it was difficult to know who was the victor. A dispute arose immediately. All took sides, and in less than ten minutes, every man was fast locked in a grapple with his nearest foe. There were no police to maintain order, and was the biggest row at now known. <coughs> I always called it the Battle of Bomar. The fight extended over two hours until sundown, and the combatants swayed to and fro off the hard road into the deep snow, each too drunk to do his enemy any harm. I sat with several other boys on a fence outside Willing's Hotel and cheered them on. Darkness fell ere the battle ceased and an old Irishman named McBride took a lantern and went to seek for the dead and wounded. <coughs> Finding none, he searched carefully for traces of blood, but in vain. To this day, no decision of this memorable race has ever been satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> and Is that I have hearing aids, so somebody will probably have to translate what you're asking. If you have a question, um, we do have a traveling mic at the back, so if we should be able to use that, that would be my thing. If you just raise your hand, Glenn will try and touch base with you. Any questions? Well, I don't think anybody's got any questions. <laughs> I think they've sat long enough. I'm sure Helen will be available for those of you.